Now, Pavarotti was a good friend. Hello. Welcome to The Revealing. I'm your host, Pavarotti, here to discuss the Idaho 4 case. As a disclaimer, this channel is for entertainment purposes. These are my opinions, and I'm not here to slander anyone. So let's get right into it. In this episode, I think it's important to cover this subject because this is an important subject to cover in this case. And unless you understand this aspect of the case completely, then you'll be, well, you'll be having trouble trying to figure out all the particulars in this thing, right down to the hearings that you see in court. So, also, this video is going to be very important for you to completely understand uh, the next video that I'm going to be putting out, which is a very serious video. The next video I put out, I'm, I'm going to show you how the informants in the case pointed the finger at Kopaka and in return, Koberger. And I'm also going to show you how, as they pointed the finger at them, it was a stroke of luck for the perpetrators to be able to put this thing off on other people beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I think I'm really going to open your eyes with that one. But before I get there, you have to understand this point. And that's the fact that during this entire investigation, from the time that the detectives walked through the front door of the King Road house after the atrocity, they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt exactly what they were dealing with. All of the clues necessary are left for you to be able to see what they saw. And here's what they saw. They saw a atrocity that could have only been committed by multiple perpetrators. And then you have to ask yourself, once they know that it was committed by multiple perpetrators, then they had to figure out fairly quickly what in the world would have caused something like this to happen? Because it wasn't a haphazard crime. This was something that investigators with experience would be able to determine very quickly that this wasn't some college kids carrying out a vendetta these were serious individuals that committed this crime. They knew that. They knew it from the beginning. And I'm going to show you in this video why they knew that. I'm going to give you those clues that the investigators would have had to have seen. And I'm going to explain why we're at where we're at now in this case. And to do that, though, there's a few things you, you just got to understand. And we're going to start with it right here. But before we do that, let me just bring this up. Because I did uh, several videos here recently where I showed a, a map where the families all lived at one point, all within a short distance of each other. And I mentioned that, you know, a couple of their daughters lived with them. And at one point in time, I'm sure that, you know, Zanna probably spent time with her mother at her residence. And... I had a couple of content creators really come at me hard for that. One of them left me a message in my comments saying she she never was even near her mother and 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 she I believe he said she grew up in Arizona. Um, and then I had another one that made a whole video about how she never was near Coeur d'Alene and she stayed with her her aunt in Post Falls, Idaho, and. And you know, no, no, no ties to Coeur d'Alene for her. Explain this then. 
And there has been an incredible outpouring of emotion following this tragedy. People all across the inland northwest looking for ways to support those families of the victims. Happening right now, the Coeur d'Alene Texas Roadhouse, which is where Xana used to work, is holding a fundraiser in honor of all of those victims. Our Kyle Simchuk is there tonight. And Kyle, what's been the reaction from the community that you've seen tonight? Well, just a bunch of people here. When, when we first got here about an hour ago, there was a line of people out the door eager to get in asking about this fundraiser. And we also talked to some people. They had no idea there was even a fundraiser going on tonight. But they said, hey, we're going to have to order extra steaks tonight. Maybe take them home. They just want to support these families. Well, it sure is interesting that uh, she worked at the Texas Roadhouse in Coeur d'Alene, about 600 feet from where her uh, mother lived. But... You know, maybe y'all are all right and I'm wrong. I don't know. But I know I'm not wrong about in the beginning of the investigation, the law enforcement put out publicly that police not ruling out multiple unalivers. Of course, they're not ruling them out. They're looking for them. The Moscow police chief, though, has said they do not know if the victims were killed by one person or if perhaps there was another killer. One individual kill four people at night and not wake up the other two roommates. Our um, investigation will continue to look at all avenues of that investigation. Um, I cannot disclose um, any of that information. I don't even. So let's take a look at some of these things in the PCA that lets us know that it wasn't one perpetrator that law enforcement was after. Number one, we have the Van Shoe Print. I know everybody remembers that. This is out of the probable cause affidavit. And why would they go through all of the trouble to put the Van Shoe Print in the probable cause affidavit if it wasn't going to be a critical clue in the case? And you can see during the processing of the crime scene, investigators found a latent shoe print. This was located during the second processing of the crime scene by Idaho State Police forensic team by first using a presumptive blood test and then amino black, a protein stain that detects the presence of cellular material. The detected shoe print showed a diamond-shaped pattern similar to the pattern of a van-type shoe, a vans-type shoe sole. Just outside the door of Mortensen's bedroom, located on the second floor, and this is consistent with Mortensen's statement regarding the suspect's path of travel. Now, what they're insinuating is this shoe stepped in blood and it left a print that was not visible to the naked eye. They had to use amino black to be able to make it come to light. Now this is going to be very critical evidence in this case and that's why it's in the PCA. You don't hear too much about it now though, but when they went into Koberger's residences in Pennsylvania and in Washington, all they found was New Balance shoes, two pairs of dark colored boots, and one pair of brown boots. Nothing that came close to matching a Vans type shoe print. So why have we never heard anything else about this evidence? This evidence right here is critical to the prosecution's case. You can bet that they're going to suggest that the Vans type shoe print was worn by the co-defendant in the case. Now, you can see here again from the PCA, as I entered this bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed in the room. Both Gonzalez and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. Now, for some reason in the PCA, they leave out the autopsy report, which is a critical point for them to leave out because they did not leave out the autopsy report when they got down to Zana and Ethan. 
So why is there no mention of what the autopsy shows as cause of death? Because they did not want out in the public sphere the differences in the cause of death between Maddie and Kaylee. But we know there was differences because of this statement. Means of death don't match. Maddie's and Kaylee's cause of death. It does not matter based on the autopsy report. They don't match. Here's what you have to understand. And I want you to really use your critical thinking when it comes to this. If you have two girls in the same bed and one perpetrator is unaliving them with a knife, you can absolutely unequivocally determine that the methods of unaliving them would be exactly the same or maybe very slightly because he's committing the act at the same time with two different individuals in the same area. He's not going to he's not going to deviate from one victim to the next victim. So by the two victims having completely different manners of being unalived, that indicates not that one of them was the target and the other one wasn't. Again, it's a dark room with two Similar blonde females in a bed, the perpetrator is not really going to be able to determine who is who at this point, but with two different causes of the unalivings in the case, that indicates two different perpetrators. That is why they did not want to put that in the probable cause affidavit. It wouldn't matter to put it in the probable cause affidavit if you wanted to hide who the actually intended target was. At that point, Koberger has been arrested. What would it matter which one of them was his intended target? What matters to them is to not let the cat out of the bag that it was two perpetrators committing the crime. Now, when we go down to Kernodal and Chapin's deaths, you can see it says, I approached the room, I could see a body, later identified as Kernodal's, laying on the floor. Kernodal was deceased with wounds which appeared to have been caused by an edged weapon. Also in the room was a male, later identified as Ethan Chapin, hereafter Chapin. Chapin was also deceased with wounds later determined, later determined, autopsy report provided by the Spokane County Medical Examiner, dated December 15, 2022, almost, I mean, over a month later, to be caused by sharp force injuries. See, they couldn't just put it in there as an edged weapon because it wasn't. It was sharp forced injuries. But that is letting you know, once again, there are two different people in one room in the same proximity, but they were unalived this time, not only in two different manners, but by two different weapons. One perpetrator is not going to be able to accomplish that. Anybody with eyes to see and ears to hear would be able to determine that. Now, the clue that they give you that there's more than one perpetrator is something that people have scrambled around with and tried to come up with anything in the world of why the perpetrator would have said this to a victim over the last year and a half when it's clearly a statement from one perpetrator to the other perpetrator. Mortensen then said she heard a male voice saying something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Yes, that's one perpetrator talking to the other perpetrator. And when you look at the two victims in the room with different manners of being unalived by different weapons, it's easy to determine that that was a statement from one perpetrator to the next. Now, 
People have said many, many times, well, after they unalived Copaca, why didn't they just go ahead and announce that they had the unaliver and tell everybody it was over? Well, it's real simple because every investigator in this case knew there was multiple perpetrators. Just by finding Copaca and unaliving him is not going to solve the crime. They have to have another perpetrator to be able to explain the events in the atrocity. And that's where the gag order comes into play. Now, this gag order is obviously in there to help the defense, first of all, because anything that you can keep out of the public sphere until trial helps not prejudge the defendant. That is, that is a, a known fact in any case. But as you see, the prosecution push for the gag order almost as much, if not more, than the defense in this case, that's where you see that something is not right. Because from the prosecution's perspective, more information out into the public because of the evidence they have against their perpetrator, their defendant, the person they arrested, that is going to do nothing but benefit the prosecution. So they would be the ones arguing not to have a gag order if they had the proper evidence and they wanted everything out into the public sphere. But in this case, that's not happening. The prosecution wants the gag order as much as the defense, if not more. Now, why is that? President, University of Idaho. Today's news of arrest is a welcome one. You see Scott Green in almost all of those interviews about the case, standing right there, either talking or at least standing next to the detectives in the case, Chief Fry, he's always present. And it's a known fact that he met with the investigators on a daily basis in this case. Now, why is that? Well, real simple. Because he was going to make sure that information did not get out about what the investigators knew about this case because it would absolutely impact enrollment in the University of Idaho at a time where they were purchasing the University of Phoenix, so it would have hurt them the most, but also the fact that just the nature of the crime and the pretense around who would have committed a crime of that nature and why would absolutely impact the university and therefore impact everything else in the town. Now, it's been said that the university is protecting other university students, such as the frats or other students of the university. Well, folks, I can tell you, the university, if they could have taken one or two other students and said they committed this crime, it was a crime of passion, they would have done it in a heartbeat because that would not impact enrollment in the university. They already had four of their students unalived. To be able to point to two other bad students, say they arrested them and the threat is gone, they would have done that in a heartbeat. Because if they were protecting the students so much, you got to think about it, what about WSU? Similar college, are you saying that they're protecting their students, but WSU doesn't care anything about their students and faculty because they're going to allow the University of Idaho to take their teacher student and charge him with the crimes so that the Washington State University looks bad? See, that argument goes completely out the window. That does not impact the university's revenue in the town. What would impact the university's revenue in the town is other things. But why were they able to eliminate so many suspects so fast in this case? And it's real simple. And if you think about it, the prime suspects were eliminated really fast. 
Authorities found no signs of sexual assault. Moscow police are saying at this time in the investigation, they do not believe the two surviving roommates or a man seen standing near a local food truck were involved in any way in the murders. Moscow they were eliminated fast because law enforcement already knew the involvement of the victim's families in what type of lifestyle that they were living. And they knew this because they were very familiar with them from arrests. Now, they weren't familiar with one of the other family members in this case because they didn't have those arrests for them to be familiar with, and their attorney directed them not to even discuss anything with the investigators in the case, which is almost unbelievable. But law enforcement knew what the likelihood of this atrocity was from, and when they put everything in play and arrested Brian Koberger, they would never want to put out the fact that Koberger may possibly have had an accomplice, accomplice, an accomplice in this case. Why? Because by arresting just Koberger and only naming him as the assailant, it would put the narratives, and they knew this, in the mindset of the Bundys or incel, but with two perpetrators, they would never be able to push a narrative such as that. With two perpetrators, then you have purpose, then you have reason, and you have to be able to explain that reason. One perpetrator that didn't know the victims, oh, absolutely, it's a one-off psycho. Two perpetrators, Nope, now we've got purpose. Now you have to explain to the community what really was going on. And this is what the community would absolutely visualize in their minds. And enrollment in that school would have plummeted, knowing that activity like this was going on around their kids. And this isn't something that they could fix with just an arrest. Now, That's when you look into the documents and you see just a boilerplate statement in the initial discovery request of statements of the co-defendant, any written or recorded statement by a co-defendant, and the substance of any relevant oral statement made by a co-defendant, whether before or after arrest, in response to interrogation by any person known by the co-defendant to be a peace officer or agent of the prosecuting attorney, or which are otherwise relevant to the charge to the offense charged. Now that may be boilerplate discovery information, but is it relevant to this case if there is a co-defendant who is no longer alive? Now see, we all believe that there's no way for them to to use anything from a dead co-defendant because of the Sixth Amendment. It would violate it if a dead man's statement was admitted because you cannot confront your accuser. The conf confrontation clause of the Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution binding on the states through the 14th Amendment guarantees the right of a criminal defendant to be confronted with the witness against him. So the Sixth Amendment actually prohibits that. So why would they even want the statements of the co-defendant or any writ written or recorded statement by the co-defendant? Why would that even be necessary to request in discovery if the Sixth Amendment prohibits it being used against the client? Well, folks, that's because our law these days is so opaque that it's hard to determine what is legal and what is not because of this thing called precedent. And it turns out that there is precedent in this case that weaved its way around the Sixth Amendment 
And I'm sure the prosecution is well aware of it, and the defense probably is as well. And you can see a recent California Supreme Court decision wherein the trial court admitted the confession of a co-defendant who died in jail prior to trial. The confession admitted responsibility for an unaliving but pinned most of the blame on the remaining defendant. And it was admitted into trial and used as evidence against the remaining defendant in his case. That's why those statements of an unalived co-defendant are important to both the defense and the prosecution. Now, here is the reality of the situation in my humble opinion. I do not believe that law enforcement or the prosecution at this point believes that Mr. Koberger nor Mr. Kopaka are the actual perpetrators in this crime. However, I believe that they're more than happy to try them as the perpetrators, lose the case, and forever put it in the public's mind that they had the real perpetrators and the justice system just could not keep them held. Either that or they're just really dense and uh, they believed a scumbag confidential informant statements and they still believe them to this day despite the fact that all their evidence is blowing up in their face. But that is uh, something that I think we'll be able to determine once this trial starts. Now, again, the reason that I wanted to go through the co-defendant in this case is because in my next video, I'm going to lay out some things that is going to be very hard to deny. And that's why I say I believe Mr. Koberger is a very unlucky individual. I don't believe he committed the atrocity. I believe the evidence that I'm going to show will, or the evidence that I've already shown really, um, really kind of takes him out of that. But I'm going to show additional evidence that, that makes it to where I don't, I don't think there's any way that he could have done it. But I'm also going to show how the confidential informant in the case gave up Kopaka and, and in return Koberger. And I, I finally figured out how the heck it all came together. And um, I've been wanting to put it out and show y'all, but I got to do everything in order. So next video, that one's coming. Um, but please like and subscribe to the channel. Post your comments, thoughts, criticisms. And until next time, Pavarotti's out.